Um, so, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nir, and uh, I'm here to speak a little bit about bug bounty programs uh, evolution. Uh, before I begin, I just want to do a short presentation about myself. Uh, it will be pretty quick. So, um, I'm working as security architect uh, for this company, but it's not related to this talk. This is something that I've did, I did before uh, working in this company. Um, so, a uh, little bit research that I've done is about this, that, and released a few open source tools. But actually, I'm here because I'm trying to show something that I've done. Uh, I'm actually an entrepreneur. Uh, this is like a hacker, but different spelling. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, I just want to, to show you the research that I've done in the last three years uh, about bug bounty programs. Um, and it started actually as, as, um, as an academy final project. I thought about a way to, uh, to create a bug bounty program, uh, which was something that I, I saw on, on iTest, but on, not, not from the security perspective, but from the QA perspective. So, okay, I thought about creating this bug bounty program, and I decided that I want to upload images, like a testing environment, uh, in order to, to allow this safe bug bounty program. But then I realized, okay, it may be a problem if we want to maybe use mainframes for, for the testing, and then, well, it may be a problem. So I've just decided to limit it to a specific scope, and I thought, okay, maybe I'll use VMware. I can take VMware, I can just develop a nice GUI, and then just let um, the customers kind of uh, upload the images to my environment, and then they'll be able to, to do the pen testing pretty easily. Um, and it was pretty nice, because if someone tries to drop the database, well, it's a test environment, so that's easy, that's safe. The problem was, uh, during this development, that I started to develop kind of virtual IP addresses, which is something that Amazon already developed, so I couldn't go with it. It was a patent by, by Amazon. So I just figured out, okay, if you can beat them, join these guys. Uh, but yet, I just thought about it, and when, if, if I just define uh, a virtual environment per tester, that would, be, that would be really great, because every tester will have his own environment. If you have kind of persistent XSS, probably uh, you won't see it in the other environment, which is pretty perfect. On the other hand, if I want to create a new environment for the tester, uh, then I'll probably need to pay for the traffic, for the VM. And there's a lot of payments uh, on the way when I want to create such an environment per tester. And by the way, no one promises that the tester will find findings, so I see only outcomes, not incomes. And then I met this guy. Uh, this was my partner. Uh, his name is Shai. And we, we decided to kind of establish a new company, which was closed a few months ago. Uh, it was a pretty nice concept. We decided to develop a company that does safe bug bounty programs, uh, which is the, the difference between bug bounty programs and safe bug bounty programs is totally different, and I'll explain it here. So um, I know that that's a failure, but yet we've decided uh, that it may be good to spread ideas here uh, and let you know what is my thoughts here and what can be improved in the future. So let's start with the evolution of bug bounty programs, or actually bounty hunters. So um, the bounty hunter, not in the virtual world, let's say the physical world, uh, is someone that probably don't want to be identified. He's bypassing things as a way of life. So all these ones, like killers, let's say like this, they have kind of terms, terms and conditions that are found, by the way, it's through Tor, you'll probably find a lot of bounty hunters there. Uh, and I saw that they, they really know what they want to do, they know where to aim, and they also have few things that are similar to the way of work that we see today in the bug bounty programs. So I just thought about it. If a uh, if someone tries to kill and he succeeds with it, he'll get the money, obviously, or, or maybe he won't and then he'll need to kill again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yet, if he kills someone, 
probably he'll get not only the money, because that's only one-time payment, he'll get a good, good reputation. By the way, if he doesn't succeed to kill someone, probably he don't need any more any reputation, because maybe someone killed him. Um, so uh, as bug bounty hunters, um, there are specific targets that the bounty hunters uh, choose. So some of them choose to kill animals, some of them choose to kill kids, people, women, politicians, uh, etc. And well, any, um, any killer also chooses what to hack or what to kill. Because uh, let's say I saw something uh, pretty nice in terms and conditions that uh, one killer said that uh, if someone just wants him to, to kill a politician, uh, that would be fast. Doesn't matter if, if you want to, to pay more money, because that's the way he works, that's the way he believes that it should be done. Uh, so that's the physical world. Okay, just let's keep it on the side, because this is something old, this is something that started a long time ago. But someone knows what happened in 1995? Raise your hand if you know what happened in 1995. No one? Yeah? Yeah, so I wish I had prizes here. Do you want my iPhone? Sure. No? <laughs> it's old. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Netscape uh, established the, the first bug bug program. Um, and, well, the, the, the first bug bug program actually was not in terms of security. It just, uh, th these guys just wanted to. Uh, to do good QA for the environment, and they thought, okay, maybe a lot of people will be smarter than five people that testing uh, the software. Uh, so they they just decided to to put the trunk of their development and just let the QA uh, to, to test it. It was pretty nice, but how do you think it worked? Well, I'll explain it. That's pretty easy. Um, just putting the code there somewhere, and uh, and the, the testers went to the to this code uh, and was able to test it. And as long as they uh, submit findings, that was nice. But then comes the the part of the rewards. Well, someone knows what uh, what were the rewards then in 1995? Raise your hand if you heard about it. No. Okay. Great. So there is a Netscape Polo T-shirt. That was nice. And the uh, uh, Netscape mug. That's all. No money, just prizes. And you know what? A lot of people did it because they wanted a mug with the Netscape logo. <laughs> I know they couldn't afford themselves to buy the mug with the Netscape logo, so they just got it. So um, do you think it was a successful story or not? Raise your hand if you think that it was a success story. All the rest, get out. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it was a success story, and I'll explain you why. In 2004, uh, which is following the acquisition of NCR, well, well following the acquisition of Netscape by AOL, um, well, a new foundation started, Mozilla Foundation, which is something that uses the, the same engine the, the Netscape used and created a new company, Mozilla. So Net Mozilla is kind of Netscape, but an open source. And well, they started in 2004 the, their uh, bug bounty program. And again, it succeeded, and you'll see the results uh, of today. Um, this is something that I just found a few months ago uh, when, when it was kind of a result of the hard bleed uh, attack. They just said, hey guys, I just signed my software. Um, can you find few vulnerabilities there? And I'm willing to pay a lot for that. By the way, they're not giving t-shirts anymore for that. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, we know about bug bounty programs and we understand that this is a pretty good idea. And yet I just want to share with you the perspectives that the business thinks about them and then what the bug bounty hunter looks uh, in these programs. So let's start with the business. I just decided to, uh, to split the perspectives to three. Uh, the first of them is the technology um, uh, perspective. Let's say that from technology perspective, probably I'll need to handle a lot of traffic because hackers 
they don't use one thread. <laughs> they don't need to use one thread. Uh, so probably they'll use uh, 10 threads or more, depends on the, the amount of tools they have uh, and how strong their computer, mm -hmm. by the way. And then, um, obviously, when when the, the, the customer or the, or the business will receive this traffic, uh, it may be affect on the performance um, and obviously it, it can do a lot of other things. So maybe these companies need to uh, upgrade their IDS or IPS. By the way, this is the one that just barks, right? This is something else. This can bite. This is the IPS. So, um, this means that I'll need to upgrade my, my, my machines in order to stop an attacks from various sources uh, and this is probably will be done on the production environment. On the other hand, maybe I have a WAF. So again, I need to pay a lot of money to get stronger WAF. So that's the technology uh, and it can be solved by money. It's not easily but it depends on the, on the size of the company. And then um, I'm just thinking about the operations. Okay, so we have the operation, we have the bug bounty program, and then the question is how do I manage incidents? Well, if someone tries to do DDoS, how do I manage that? If someone tries to drop my, my, my database uh, because he just found pretty nice SQL injection, well, it will be a problem because I need an incident response team. And sometimes in, in, in small, medium businesses, they don't have an incident response team. So if we'll go to the, to the enterprises, to the big ones, probably it's not a problem. But if we'll go to the small ones, well, they just need to think about maybe engaging a third party company uh, to, do, to do this for them, or maybe uh, someone can supply that for them as part of the service of uh, being in bug, bug bounty program. So uh, this is the first problem, but the second one is kind of different because I know that I'll have bugs because someone will, f will finally find something there. Obviously, hackers are pretty good, mainly if there are a lot of hackers that try to, to find bugs there. So I just thought about it. Maybe, maybe I should manage it as part of my change control system. Yeah, and that means that all the developers in the company will be able to see the bugs. That's not good because they can sell them pretty easily. So maybe someone that can supply this bug bounty program can also supply me kind of bug bounty management system, which is pretty good if it's secure enough. And obviously this is something that should be managed somewhere in the cloud uh, unless it's a proprietary, proprietary development. Uh, so that's, that's just a problem. So I just thought about other things. And this is something that one of the customers that, uh, that I worked with asked me. You know what? No problem. I'll give you to, to do bug bounty program. But what happens if someone just harms my business? What's then? Who should I sue? Well, there are bounty hunters. How will you sue them? You can't. So probably you'll need to sue the company that engages these bounty hunters. That's a problem. No one wants to get the liability on that. And by the way, I, I'm not familiar with the CISO that will want to go home because someone just harms his business and there's no one that he can sue in case of something or in case of breach. So uh, let's, let me just split the bug bounty programs into two. There are self-owned bug bounty programs and there are external bug bounty programs. If I'll talk about the self-owned, well, there's a lot of companies that, uh, that just created a bug bounty program for themselves. And you can see a pretty nice list here. Uh, by the way, if you want, there's pretty much more extended list uh, on Bug Crowd website. Um, so this is just an example. And the other external are actually companies that um, that actually provide the service of creating a bug bounty program. And I, I'm not sure that I posted all of the companies here, but I saw a few logos here. Raise your hand if you're from external company. Yeah, so there's a lot of people here. Uh, pretty nice. So le let me just explain you a little bit about the external companies because the self-owned are the ones that the enterprises can afford themselves. 
The self-owned are for the rest. Um, one of the things that I saw uh, on one of these companies, the external ones, that, the, that these companies can actually build an A team. They can build an elite team of pen testers. Um, and that's pretty good because the elite team probably will be better than five other pen testers because probably if you'll, ga if you'll gauge a company, I know that you trust this pen testing company, but yet there is only three to five people of right team that does this pen testing. On the other hand, um, well, wh when an external company builds an A team, that means that this company can trust these hackers. And then they can feel more comfortable when actually engaging them to do pen testing because, as I said, no one wants to be sued. The next thing that these external companies do, or part of them, they actually uh, verify the identity of the hackers. Because, well, I need to know who's the hacker behind of all the testing there. Because if something happens, I want to know how to reach him. So uh, there are a few ways to do identity ver verification. Uh, first of them, it's pretty easy. Just register with your email. But it can be a 10 minutes mail. But yet, someone can register. On the other hand, I saw one company, um, I think it was CNAC, that uh, actually identifies uh, with, uh, with the real ID, uh, identifies these users. And that means that if someone do something wrong, he knows that they have his ID. And that's pretty good. Um, the next thing that external companies do uh, is, is actually the kind of meeting place. Um, where meeting place is not a new concept, but yet if you have a good meeting place with a good blog and good uh, community, probably you'll be able to get better testers. So if you get better testers, uh, I suppose that this company can, be, uh, can provide better services. Uh, so this is one thing that this company do, but if you have already a meeting place, probably this company, or by the way, this is uh, at least the, the way to do it, this company should be a middleman. That means that if someone pays for a bug, they do kind of revenue sharing. So if someone pays, I don't know, $500 for, for a bug, let's say that the company pays $500, then probably uh, this external company will take a specific percent of it as a revenue and then uh, will leave the rest for the hacker. The majority, by the way, should go to the hacker. Um, Another thing that I saw in these external companies uh, is also uh, a nice idea, is the traffic shaping. Uh, traffic shaping is like, let's say, using a private VPN. When using private VPN to connect to websites and then to test them, well, if I already identified the users, then I can actually verify their identity by using a VPN. On the other hand, uh, VPN is not the, the only solution that can be done here. Uh, I, for instance, uh, did something um, as URL authentication. I won't provide you the solution here, but just think about it and probably you'll get to the solution here. So um, there are a few benefits and concerns from the business side when they decide to, to go with the bug bounty programs. I just want to begin with the benefits. The benefits that, uh, first of all, they have various payment models. They don't need to pay as a fixed price all the times as they do with, with the company, unless they want to, to do a kind of competition, which is a pretty nice idea. So they have various ways to, to, to give something additional to the testers. So money is one of them. But hey, most of the testers want to be on Google. So they have a Hall of Fame, uh, which is a pretty nice idea. Probably you'll see a lot of them. Um, and there are obviously a few prices. But the thing is that a Hall of Fame, let's say Google, you go to Google and you know that the Hall of Fame is only for Google. But for the external companies, the Hall of Fame is not only for Google. The Hall of Fame is something much wider. It goes to all of the websites that uh, the tester test. So it can be good for the testers that try to go wider, but it's not that good for the testers that, that just have the mentions to, let's say, test only e-commerce websites. So I just thought about it, and maybe, maybe a few promotions can help here. Let's say that these external companies can say, okay, I have 
the whole Hall of Fame for all the websites. But maybe I should just create a Hall of Fame per customer. And then the one that tests only e commerce websites will be able to get recognition of it. Another thing that can be done as part of this program is that, well, if someone just gets uh, into the Hall of Fame of a specific customer, probably this customer will want that these guys that in the Hall of Fame will test them again. Because in the beginning, probably you'll find technical things. But as long as you test more, um, a specific platform, you understand the business. And when you understand the business, it's much more easier to find bugs. So if you have already experience with one of the customers, probably you'll want to pay them more to get back. So uh, this is not something that the external company should do. Probably I believe that customers will want to get these promotions. Uh, but yet it's a pretty nice idea. Um, the next thing is pretty good benefit because as I said, a uh, thousand hackers are much better than five and the customers get a real world hacking scenario in this case. Uh, except the fact that they have a real world hacking scenario, a company that writes that they have a bug bounty program uh, probably can be pictured as a leader. And why I'm saying that? Because if you're not mature enough, you won't put a bug bounty program. Or if it's not early enough uh, during the development stages. So if I'm just putting in bug bounty program, that means that I know that I need security and I want the best security. Not only from one company, but really from m the majority of the hackers. On the other hand, there are a few concerns. Let's say that the first concern is, well, what should I test? Should I test the production? Should I test the testing, staging environment? Who thinks that the better way to test is the testing environment? No one? One? OK. Who thinks that the production is better? And the rest? No thinking or what? <laughs> okay, so the testing environment have a benefit. For instance, if someone drops the database, it will be only on the testing environment. On the other hand, no one can promise that the testing environment or the staging environment is similar to the production. And that means that not all high risk uh, vulnerabilities can be really found. Only the specific ones that just developed now. Um, and the, big, the best example here is just using SSL. I can use no trusted certificate on the, on the testing and then just putting something trusted on the, on the production environment. And then I'll need to pay for the hacker, although it's not a vulnerability at all. The next concern um, is actually data leakage. Let's say that we go to the, to the production and then we have credit cards on the website. Great. We have credit cards, we have bounty hunters, and then we just need to calculate. I have 100,000 100, credit cards on one hand, and I have $500 price. What would you choose? I think that I would go with, with credit cards. That's better. Another thing that is pretty, pretty much big concern is the null of service. Uh, well, this is pretty obvious because if we have a lot of testers and it goes to the production environment, uh, it is a feasible problem. Next one is, uh, well, the way we detect uh, black hats. Because let's say that we have a bug bounty program and we have our perimeter, and that's pretty nice. But then we're exposed to all the good hackers and the, bad, and the bad ones. And the thing that we don't want to happen is this. Well, this is Facebook. It's, by the way, the screenshot from 1337. Uh, raise your hand if you know this website. OK. So uh, I'll just explain uh, shortly. This is a website that you can find a lot of exploits there. And, you, and for part of them, you need to pay. So you don't want to, to get posted there because the hacker can post the vulnerability there and get a little bit more money uh, than he planned to get as part of the bug bounty program. OK, so that's another concern. Um, what happens when there are too many bounty hunters and then not all of them really understand security? So let's say uh, that um, 
something that I got from one of the, one of the companies. They, they have a lot of hackers, let's say from India. Um, no, no mentions to harm anyone. Um, but these hackers sometimes just try to, to post bugs that are not security bugs. For instance, uh, the CSS here is not working. This is not a security bug. And someone really thinks that he'll get money for that? Not really. So the, the problem here is not the posting of the bugs. The problem is who verifies that? I can get thousands of bugs of CSS, incorrect CSS, and then I need to spend my time as an external company to verify these bugs. And if I'm not spending this time, probably the customer will need to spend this time to verify CSS bugs. Well, it can be nice because they have another QA team, but that's not the purpose of this bug bounty program. Um, so there's something nice that I saw on, on, on uh, Bug Crowd's uh, website. They actually see when customer will see or get a kind of um, notification from the customers that they say, hey guys, we have uh, performance issues, just notify the hackers that they need to stop. Yeah, so uh, they're sending mails um, and notifying the hackers to stop. Most of the hackers will stop. So that's kind of a good solution. Maybe it can be better, but this is a pretty good solution because if, let's say, we don't have an external company, it will be hard to identify the users and then send them the mail because we don't know who tests us. Um, the next one is kind of minimizing the exposure time. Let's say that we found something uh, as hackers on the website, and now obviously we're posting it. But then maybe the hacker posts it in other websites. So how can I be sure that actually someone will stop this attack? So I can try to, to prevent somehow zero days by just not, not uh, publishing it somewhere. But yet, the company needs to identify that there is a time, a specific time, that they have to fix the, the issue. And if they don't fix it, probably the hacker will want to publish it. So these are the, the perspective from the business side. But let's, let's look on, at the bug bounty hunters. And these guys are obviously uh, the most experienced people in the world. because. They tired from working only on their day job. They just want to find the next thing. So they're just looking for, for bugs uh, in, in these companies that uh, allow bug bounty programs. Um, but a small problem that we have here is that it's a little bit hard to, uh, to classify these hackers because all of them are equal. And we don't know which hacker is better. Uh, and then, well, I'm just competing with other hackers, and why is that? Because they just write that they have eight years of experience, although they have eight months of, of, of experience. So this is not exactly fair to, to, to work with uh, a variety of um, pen testers, but that's the fact, and everybody should work together. So I just thought about the motivations. Well, actually, I not only thought about it, I just interviewed a few hackers and I try to understand what motivates them to do bug bounty programs. So the first thing is pretty obvious. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we all want, but with dollars. Yeah. Um, the next thing is uh, prestige. Hackers wants to be the ones who are identified as the, the best hackers of a certain bug bounty program. Let's say hackers wants to be on Google, Facebook, PayPal, and hackers wants to be the best of an external, uh, external bug bounty program because that means that they have experience uh, in various websites, not only specific websites. Uh, and this is good because um, I think that, uh, that uh, if someone looks for a name uh, on Google, probably you'll want to have more than 10 pages on Google, and that this can lead to it. Um, the next question is, um, which one of you likes gaming? No one? Okay. That's all? Only half? Okay. So hackers 
most of them likes gaming. And since they likes gaming, if you combine gamification into these programs, it will be much easier because let's say you have ranks, you have uh, kind of uh, kings and, and newborn hackers, and then you can just give ranks to them. That would be pretty nice because they will try to get to the king hacker. And they won't stop until they get there. And until they get there, probably you'll invent another ranks. So that's good. It won't end anyway. On the other hand, there are a few frustrations on these programs. Um, the first of them is something that, well, I did a um, little bit more than a year ago, or less. Yeah, it's less than a year ago. Um, I just found something on a company's website. Well, a company, is, it's, it wasn't a website. It was uh, their messaging system. And I decided to post a bug, and not because I just wanted the money, because this company not giving money. I just wanted to post because I'm using this service. And then I posted it, and I asked them, guys, what's going on? I, I want to publish it. Yeah, I, I just want to be on Google. But guys, tell me what's happening. And they're not transparent enough. They just need the hackers to ask them every time, just pulling <laughs> data for them. What's going on? Are you fixing it? Because no one wants to be bad. The hackers want to be good, but yet they don't have the patience to wait for that all time. Yeah? <laughs> um, great. Another thing is the fact that no one really knows when bug bounty program stops. They can just post something on an HTML page. They can say, hey guys, just stop testing me. I know that you don't see this text, so I just decided to bring it on to you. So we can see that the bug bounty program object changed to cancellation. This is something for PayPal's website. Damn. Hey, it's really hard to get accepted at DEF CON. Some love for our first time speaker. <laughs> to DEF CON. <laughs> nice job. Do you have more? <laughs> yes, we do. Do you want another? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, the first one is free. <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? Keep it coming, keep it coming. All right, we'll get you. Right. Only me? No, yeah, what about you? You guys want to do it alone. Oh, I see. I <laughs> you need to split? Can you drink? Hey, need to it's easier, man. I'm in. Do we? <laughs> I'm sorry, don't we appear to be drinking? <laughs> we can have completely. Maybe you are. <laughs> Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All Cheers. Right, to DEF CON again. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Carry on. Give me another bottle. <laughs> no. Okay. You're cut off. <laughs> okay. Speak responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so, um, this is one of the problems that we have here. Because no one really knows when bug bounty program stops. And then I can post a bug as a hacker, but then no one can assure me that I'll get the money from it. This is one thing. And in the worst case, someone can sue me because I'm just testing his website, although it's prohibited. So I have a case study. I understand that this guy, uh, Oren Hafif, uh, may be in DEF CON. So if Oren's here, hey, this is Oren. This is the case study uh, that I got from his website. Yeah, uh, you'll need to pay me because I'm publishing you. Uh, so um, this is something that I've got from his uh, website. Um, Oren is, uh, is a bounty hunter, and he found something on Google. He just exposed um, uh, the way that he can get emails on, on Google, email addresses. I just don't want to get into details of it because you can probably find it on his website. But then he posted it to Google. And the first response was denied because, well, it's not a risk. That's what Google said. But then he posted it again while explaining them that this is a real risk, and they just decided to reward him with $500. As a result of that, 
I just started to look the title of what you've done, and I saw, well, I just stopped at page three on Google with various websites that just posting how bad it is, because he really found something that can cause a lot of losses for Google. I think that someone just uh, calculated it to, to uh, more than $1,200, uh, $12,000, sorry. Uh, and it's not really much money, but the, then the PR would be bad for Google if someone finds that. So um, that's just, just a case study of someone that I believe, I didn't get this uh, feeling from him, but I believe that it can be a little bit frustrating. Another thing that can be a little bit frustrating for the testers is uh, the fact that someone just records what they do. Let's say that I'm a hacker, I have my specific knowledge, that's my added value. I don't want that someone else will log everything I do. And if he logs, maybe his purpose to replace me at certain time of, t oh, at certain time, uh, of the testing. Um, that's the way, by the way, of, of uh, developing security tools because they learn how hackers work. But no one's really want to be the one that just everyone knows what he knows. That's the way why the hackers get money. So um, these are generally the, the things that um, are related to, to the business and for the testers. But I'm here actually to explain you a little bit more about what can I see in the future in the bug bounty programs. And well, I think that we need to change something. And I'm not saying that this is something that should be done by all the external companies. I'm just saying that this is only a conceptual thing that should be done. So one of the things that uh, I believe that should be done for um, the testing purposes is actually the fact that these external companies should be like um, the front end server. And that means that if someone tests, uh, doing testing, a front end server should control a lot of things that I'll explain here. Um, and then the, the benefits are that um, the front end server knows exactly who are the testers. And on the other hand, if the front end server um, wants to log something about the hackers, probably he'll be able to do it and then develop the next product. I know that this is bad for the hackers, but this is good for the business. So I just thought about how to minimize the security risks by creating a bug bounty program. And I thought, okay, if we'll allow pen testing and then um, prevent the malicious exploitation, it can be nice, but hey, I can't put a WAF there because a WAF will stop the pen testing, obviously. So uh, this is a pretty good challenge uh, if someone tries to do that because there's a lot of fine tuning that should be done here, but yet that's the idea. So um, if we'll just try to minimize the risks, I think that we can start with um, data leakage. That's a pretty good example because we said that this is one of the concerns that the business have. And we want to take one step further here. So if we have a front end server, we can do kind of deep pack inspection and actually see what's going on there. So if we're able to see what's going on there and we can validate uh, using a regular expression how actually credit cards look like, we'll be able to stop data leakage. And it can be done on credit cards, social security numbers, or anything that can work with regular expressions. Uh, what I've did then, when I had this uh, middle server, I actually created a page. Um, this page actually was kind of replaced response for the, for the hackers that says, hey man, you found something. Congratulations. The token of what you found is this one. Please, t please post this token with your name and you'll get rewarded for that. Obviously, someone will need to validate it, but yet the hacker won't be exposed to credit cards. And this is good for the business. It really minimizes the risk. Um, another thing is the fact that, um, as we all know, organizations can, can be DDoSed. So, if we have a front-end server, I'm not saying that the front-end server should be a DDoS prevention product, but if this product can somehow use another DDoS protection server, it, be, it could be pretty good because the, the websites won't be affected 
by DDoS. The only ones that can be affected by DDoS is the external company. Um, another thing that uh, I just got an input from one of the customers that I had. Um, he asked me, you know what? I want to upgrade a version of the website. And I'm really afraid because this is the production and I don't want the hackers to be able to test me while I'm just upgrading the version. Because bounty hunters are from all over the world, so nightly job is not exactly a nightly job, right? It's 5 a.m. somewhere. So uh, there should be a kind of an on-off switch for the testers if someone wants to upgrade or do any other maintenance uh, things on, on the website. Um, and the concept is pretty, pretty simple. The tester is doing their job or just stopping their job using the front end server. And then when finishing, uh, the, the testers can continue to work. Um, next one is actually we said that someone can exploit something and then report it in somewhere else. So I was just thinking if we have a front end server and we're able to log the the attempts that hackers have, probably we'll be able to identify part of the attacks, the malicious attacks, or at least the ones that are not false positives. I know that it's a great challenge to find not, pos not, not false positives. But yet, if we're able to get it, let's assume that in order to minimize this risk, we'll be able to create a WAF rule. And then the customer can just wait with the fixing, with the code fixing. But for now, we can just supply him a WAF rule, and then let's say he's, he goes with an open source uh, WAF, let's say mode security, and then we're just generating a mode security rule, and that's all, fix the problem. And by the way, if this uh, front end server has uh, a WAF it's by itself, we can do something even better. We can actually allow QA because we can apply the patch on the front end server and then let the testers just test everything and add the QA team. And then uh, probably we'll have a pretty good QA uh, testing scenario and we'll see that we don't have bugs and then we'll take this rule from the testing environment to the production, which is also uh, pretty awesome to, to have already embedded um, testing environment. So how do we really can identify black hat hackers? As I said, we need to somehow allow pen testing and prevent uh, malicious exploitation. So I just decided to, to give you a few examples of what is legitimate and what is malicious. Let's say this kind of SQL injection is pretty legitimate. Next one is also legitimate. All the selects are, well, most of the selects are legitimate. On the other hand, uh, if we'll go with the malicious SQL injection, that's pretty nice, yeah. Especially on production. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's even better if you can even drop the backups. So uh, this is one. Second thing is maybe uh, may, may include evasions. Uh, so that's kind of other way to, to do it. And the last one just shows that selecting data is not only uh, something that is legitimate, but selecting data can actually select a file from the file system and then it can be actually malicious. So there's a lot of fine tuning that should be done in, in such a front end server and it's not a WAF. This is something that is much wider than a WAF because WAF will stop all of these payloads or at least should stop all of these payloads. So, um, the problem is that we have black hat hackers and somehow we'll need to ban them from the system because we don't want them in the system. So the way to ban them is by just using kind of authentication. If we know who they are and they already registered to our system, then probably we'll need to identify them. It can be done through ID, it can be done through, uh, as I said, VPN, URL authentication, uh, or other creative methods. Uh, all of you security guys, so probably you'll find other ways except the ones that I just mentioned. Um, so if I'm thinking a little bit forward, I think that not only hackers should be in bug bounty programs. I think that if we'll just engage in other people to the bug bounty programs, it can be even better. Because, for instance, let's say that we have um, uh, attorneys. The attorney probably won't find SQL injection. 
Obviously, attorney doesn't know what is SQL injection unless someone learned to be attorney and he's a hacker, which I don't think there are people here like that. Uh, but yet, the attorney can find incorrect terms and conditions on the website. And this is pretty nice. This is a pretty short test. And if he finds something, he can just report a bug, which is a business bug. It's not exactly a technical bug. And that's nice. Um, other things are also uh, business analysts, which can test the flow, test the flows that we have in the application. And sometimes the flow can be incorrect. And obviously, I'm talking about security analysts. I'm not speaking about kind of product analysts that don't understand security. So I'm saying that when we have bad bounty programs, probably we'll need another guys except the technical ones to do the, the, do the job. And probably we'll need to reward them in other way. Uh, I don't have the properties of all of these characteristics, but we'll, we'll probably need to, to understand what it means, but yet it's a good idea. So uh, just to sum it up, I just think that the bug bound programs is a great idea. Um, it can be done through uh, internal or external uh, program. Uh, the external ones, um, as far as I understand until uh, now, they're pretty good. And I think that we'll find a lot of, of these uh, programs in the future. But yet, if I'm thinking about the business perspective and the one that really wants to defend him, you know, his, his organization and don't want to go home because someone is breached, uh, I suppose that we have a, a long journey in front of us in order to fix all these uh, risks, or at least part of them, and then we'll be able uh, much safer. Um, and if you have any questions, that's the time. Thank you.